if you're a naturalist, and by, by naturalist, I simply mean someone who is interested in the natural world. There are people who are really casual about it. There are people like me who are kind of obsessive about it, I have to admit. But if you are interested in nature, if you enjoy observing the natural world in any way at all, I think you're a naturalist. And I think you'll find that iNaturalist is a, a, a platform that can help you become a better naturalist and enjoy being a naturalist even more than you already do. It's a really remarkable uh, website. Uh, it shares some similarities with social, me social media uh, platforms like Facebook, but it's much less annoying than Facebook is. It doesn't feed you ads. It doesn't steal your data. All it does is help you be a naturalist. And it really is set up to do things that naturalists in the real world want to do. Foremost, of course, is identifying things. You know, you're walking down the, the, the trail in the woods and you see a plant and you think, wow, that's a really cool plant. I wonder what that is. That's maybe the most fundamental thing that a naturalist does. And iNaturalist can help you with that. There is an artificial intelligence engine that will make suggestions. And the whole structure of the iNaturalist platform is designed to make it possible for people who are knowledgeable to help people who are less knowledgeable. So if you put material up on iNaturalist, you sometimes get responses from world-class experts on what it is. And that's a really cool thing. Naturalists also like sharing their discoveries. And because um, iNaturalist is primarily photograph-based, photography-based, um, it's a really great way just to showcase what you found and, and, and the pleasure that you've had in finding those things. It serves as a sort of life list because it records the, the time and the place and the, uh, the date in which you saw everything that you put into iNaturalist. So it helps with your personal record keeping. And perhaps most important, it's part of a, of a research community that people are actually using uh, iNaturalist data to describe the uh, distribution of wildlife and to talk about changes in status of species, whether they're becoming more or less common. Uh, there are definitely limitations to what you can do with the, the data in iNaturalist, and I'll talk a little bit about that at some point during the presentation this evening, but it's really a, a, a remarkably well-designed program, and it does some excellent things that, uh, that are the kinds of things that naturalists really want. There are a couple of key concepts that I'm going to be referring to repeatedly. Um, basically, the first one is an observation, which is simply you create observations in iNaturalist when you upload data. And it simply is a record, usually uh, with a photograph or a sound recording, of the fact that you observe this particular thing at this particular time and place. And uh, there are, at this point, something like 75 million of those observations in iNaturalist. So it's a, a remarkably large database. The second important concept is identifications. And because nobody know, you know, not a, there's nobody in the world who knows everything about wildlife. And so there is a collaborative, collaborative system by which we arrive at identifications in iNaturalist. And we'll talk about this more, but very, very briefly, other people will add identifications to the material that you put up. Uh, if you put up no identification at all, they'll get the ball rolling. If you put up something in your right, they'll agree with you. If you put up something in your wrong, they'll correct you. And then there can be a series of exchanges and comments uh, while the sort of community works out what it is that you've seen and posted on iNaturalist. So the goal is to come, uh, come to a consensus on the identity of whatever it is that somebody has posted. And finally, uh, iNaturalist as, as an analytical tool relies extensively on filters, which are exactly what they sound like. It's just a digital way of selecting a subset of observations. So you may have all the observations from Martha's Vineyard uh, you could filter that for all the observations by Matt Pelican, or you could filter it for all the observations on a particular date or during a particular time frame, or you could filter it for a subset of Martha's Vineyard, uh, just spatially. So there are all sorts of ways that you can narrow things down and um, increase your focus. 
So it's a database. Uh, iNaturalist is a huge database and it is like any other database, a combination of data and analytical and manipulative tools that allow you to play games with that data in order to make things happen. And as I said, the things that you can do are all uh, really important things from the naturalist perspective. So it really can help you learn, it really can help you get more enjoyment, and it really can help you contribute to, to research projects. Um, it looks like that's the last of those really boring slides. So I'm going to now, um, I guess I should go back to sharing here. We're going to, uh, Fire up iNaturalist. Okay, here we go. Okay, now we're in business. P apologies for that. I'm, 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 I'm anything but an expert on Zoom. And indeed, I should probably say at this point that I'm anything but an expert and I'm naturalist. I'm really just a basic practical user. But when you log on or when you go to the, the, the site, inaturalist.org, this is where you land. Um, you can either sign up if you don't have an account. It's very simple. Uh, basically, they want your email address as an identifier and so that they can contact you. And uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, if you already have an account, you can log in just by clicking like that. Get to the login page. And this is where you land as an active iNaturalist user. It's called your dashboard. It has a lot of similarities to what's, uh, you, if, you, if you use Facebook to your uh, Facebook dashboard. But the difference is that you have a lot more control over what, occur, what appears on your dashboard with iNaturalist. Um, what I'm going to do is kind of back into the question of how to use it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about things that you can do with the data. And I think that will help you understand why the, the process for submitting data works the way it does. So we're going to do things in a somewhat different order from the way people usually uh, train others on websites. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about this dashboard page because it has a lot of important things on it. Um, one of them is uh, subscriptions, this section, if you can scroll down to this section here, and you can control what appears in your dashboard feed. Um, you'll notice that I've selected, uh, I've su subscribed, as they say, to the state of Massachusetts and the order Orthoptera. So anytime anybody posts a, or uploads an observation of an Orthoptera, that's katydids and crickets and grasshoppers, from the spatial area of Massachusetts, it pops up in my dashboard. And I do that because I'm interested in Orthoptera. You might want to do butterflies, you might want to do birds, uh, it doesn't matter. You can have multiple subscriptions. The other thing that turns up in your, um, your dashboard feed is uh, data uploaded by people who you're following. And I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but you see I'm following 21 people. You can, you can see the list of them all here. Uh, for one reason or another, they have posted something that I found interesting. And so I wanted to, to see more of what they were doing. Um, so they will also uh, turn up in my dashboard. Uh, and you can see as you scroll down there, uh, lots of people here. Um, okay, so what we're trying to do with the Martha's Vineyard of Atlas of Life is get as much information from iNaturalist into one place so that we can all see it together. And so what we've done is we've started what iNaturalist calls a project. And if you remember what I just said about filters, um, all a project is in iNaturalist speak is a fixed set of filters. So you can find the Martha's Vineyard Atlas of Life by going to the community tab and looking in projects. 
and you can type into this window. Oh, it's already it's already there. I, I will. You would have to type it in if you hadn't already done it. But uh, there you go. And it gives you a bunch of projects that have to do with Martha's Vineyard. There are actually quite a few of them. I never knew there were that many. The Land Bank has a bunch of projects that you might want to participate in. But let's go to the Martha's Vineyard Atlas of Life. Now, I would urge you, if you're interested in, in helping, uh, in, in helping uh, the Atlas of Life proceed, I would urge you to go in the upper right-hand corner and join the project. It doesn't really commit you to anything. Um, it, uh, the only reason mine says leave is because I've already joined it. Uh, the main differences are that if there are um, blog posts associated with this um, project, you'll get a notification. And also, let's go back to my dashboard for a second. Also, if you're a member of the iNaturalist project, when you go to your dashboard and click this drop down menu, you can get a much shorter list of projects. These are the ones that you specifically have joined. So that's a much faster and easier way to get back to the same place. So you're at the, uh, the Atlas of Life. And here's the landing page and it gives you some basic statistics about uh, what's going on with the project. You see, we've got a, more than 9,000 observations. Uh, representing more than 2,000 species, which is pretty good. The data density is starting to get to the point where you can actually do some useful stuff with this. Um, the filters that we use are really very simple. Uh, it's simply a spatial filter for Martha's Vineyard. Anything that gets posted from in, 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 this is historical records or contemporary ones or ongoing ones. If it's in iNaturalist and it's uh, on Martha's Vineyard, and it's supported by a little bit of uh, information, uh, it will turn up in our project. So um, lots of things you can do here. Um, if you go to this list, uh, th this map here, you can zoom in on it. It scrolls like any other map. So if you wanted to go and see what uh, observations there are in your part of the island, let's say you live out in Aquina, um, you know, you can zoom in and see what uh, what some of the observations are around where you live. You just click on one of these little items and you get to a, an observation, an oriental beetle in this case. Um, this is what an observation looks like. And you can see it was, was posted by uh, somebody whose username is Zoe Foster. It turned up in my feed and I provided an identification for it, uh, which agreed with the one that Zoe Foster had come up with. So this becomes uh, what we call a research grade observation because there's consensus about what it is. If I had um, identified this as a different beetle, there would have been a disagreement and it would, uh, would show up differently in the, um, the heading on, on the observation. Okay, and then below the map, you've got uh, a list of the recent observations and you can scroll through that and look if there's anything that you feel is, is interesting to, uh, here's a nice one, uh, a cicada killer wasp dragging a cicada around, kind of a nice action shot. That's, uh, that's a good piece of work by one of my colleagues. Okay, so let's imagine you're interested in learning more about some of the wildlife. This is a, 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 of Martha's Vineyard. You can go to view all, which basically gives you, it may take a second to load here because it's uh, prime time for using the internet, but um, this is basically a page that, that pulls together all of the observations uh, there in the uh, window on the right set in chronological order from most recent. You can scroll down through all 9,000 if you wanted to, uh, or you can uh, scroll in on the map or if you're uh, interested in learning about a particular thing, you can use these windows up at the top to, to filter what you're doing. Or you can use filters. You uh, click on the filter and you get this screen. You could get all the bird records, uh, all the amphibian records, uh, just a selection of the reptile records. You could select a time frame if you were interested in all of the records that were submitted in July 2020, you could put a start and end date. 
So that's one way to do it. But let's say just hypothetically that you're interested in robber flies, a fascinating group of flies, uh, predatory flies that are really, I think, attractive and really interesting in their biology. So you can go here and you type in robber fly. Now, iNaturalist works pretty well with common names. Common names are a little bit tricky. Uh, scientists always use the scientific name uh, just because it's, it's unambiguous. But in an effort to be as user-friendly as possible, iNaturalist recognizes common names and usually knows what you're talking about. So it, uh, we fill in the field with, uh, with a Cilidae, which is the formal name, but it really is just the scientific name for robber flies. And what that has done is filtered all of those 9,119 or whatever it was observations down to just the observations that are of, of flies in the family Acilidae. Okay, there are, so there are 72 observations and they represent 15 species, which is pretty good. That's more than I would have thought. Um, 16 people have contributed. If you wanna know who they are, you can see. Uh, it looks like I've done the bulk of the work here, but um, that's just fine. Um, you can also collect on the identifiers to see who's been doing the identifications here. And these are people who uh, are actually really, really remarkably good um, observers. Just go to this guy. He's made 94,590 identifications on iNaturalist. He's a specialist in the taxonomy of robber flies. This guy is a world-class biologist, an expert in robber flies, and he spends a good chunk of his time just donating his time and his knowledge to help the information in iNaturalist be as good as it can possibly be. So there's a lot of that going on out there. People are really serious about making this work. It's, but if you click on the species, you now have a, a, a list and they're arranged in this screen by how many observations there are. So you can see that Afaria estuans is probably the most common or one of the most common robber flies on the vineyard. It's certainly one of the ones that gets reported the most. Um, if you click on the picture, you get the species page. It tells you a little bit about the robber fly, this particular species. It gives you some web links you can connect to. It gives you uh, information on what season they occur during. Um, so it's a little bit of information about the species. But if you're interested in the robber flies specifically of, Ma of uh, Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, you can click on the white observations text. Let's, let's go to um, uh, Lafria champlainii because it's a weird looking beast. And it takes a couple of minutes sometimes for things to, uh, I, can, I can help things along by zooming in. Ordinarily, it will zoom in for you, but the internet is a little bit slow tonight, so we will need to do some, um, some manual scrolling here. Okay, so we have seven observations of this species. And look at how they're distributed. That's kind of interesting. You can see there's a cluster of, how many is that down there? It actually looks like it's four observations down along that fire lane in the state forest. A couple more in one in the northeastern part, another one in the central part of the state forest. So we already know something pretty significant about Lafria champlainii, which is that it likes these particular habitats. This is the only place that anybody is finding it on Martha's Vineyard. So it is really, we began to suspect at this point, it is really a scrub oak specialist. It really likes those dry scrub oak habitats that are so prevalent in the eastern half of the state forest. So this is an example of how you can infer a lot of information about where things are found and about what their habitat preferences are by using the combination of filters to focus on a particular species and a map to focus on where particular records occur. All right, let's go to one particular record. Um, this is a recent one just the other day. And you click on the record and what you get here is the picture. It actually was a couple of pictures that I uploaded for this one. And I will talk a little bit more about pictures in a, in a little while. 
but I put it up and you can see the, 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 the paper trail here. I, I was not quite sure what I had, so I just identified it initially as Lafria. I just identified it to the genus level. And I came back a little bit later on and I did a little bit more research on uh, actually a different website that we're not gonna talk about tonight. And I satisfied myself that Lafria champlainii was what I was photographing. So I proposed that as an identification. A little while later, this guy, uh, Tristram McKnight, Tristan McKnight came along. Let's check his profile out. Okay. He's another uh, robber fly guy and a professor of entomology in, um, and he's done 18,000 observations. Almost all of those are probably robber flies. So again, we've got another world-class expert weighing in on my little observation from Martha's Vineyard. This is the wonderful thing about the internet and about iNaturalist. It brings people together across uh, enormous distances so that they can combine um, uh, their knowledge and arrive at a better understanding of the natural world. And in this case, uh, Tristan agreed with my uh, identification. I got it right, yay. Uh, and it becomes a research grade uh, observation. Other things that show up here are a map of the observations. And it's interesting to scroll out on that. And you can see if you look at Southern New England, uh, Lafria champlainii is pretty much a creature of the coastal plain. Um, so again, it's these sandy environments in southeastern Massachusetts and Rhode Island where you're likely to get a lot of scrub oaky kinds of uh, habitat and where the, the kind of habitat that this, this robber fly prefers is found. So that, that confirms what we had surmised about its um, uh, distribution and the reason for that distribution on Martha's Vineyard. Um, okay, so that's an example of the kind of thing that you can do with iNaturalist to learn more about wildlife. We could, we could use more and more examples of these, uh, any of the other species that we had looked at, we could enter a different tax, taxonomic group up here or a different species um, and filter it to get to what we're interested in. But let's talk a little bit now about how do you get in, how do you get these observations into iNaturalist? Okay, so we'll go back to my dashboard. And what I've done is I took a few photographs the other day just outside the office here at Biodiversity Works. And I haven't identified them yet. I, I, I know what they are, but I haven't entered them into iNaturalist yet. And I'm just going to go through the process of what, it, what it's like to add uh, an observation into the system. And I will say also that you can do it on your computer by taking the card out of your computer, or out of your camera, putting it in a card reader and, and uh, uploading uh, an observation that way. But I will also say that iNaturalist has an app for mobile phones that is really, really good. It's very simple. You can't do the analytical things in a phone, but it makes it really, really easy to use the phone camera to take a, a picture or multiple pictures of something. And if you've got a data connection, you can load it in right from the field, right up to iNaturalist, and you can get identification suggestions from their artificial intelligence engine um, while you're out in the field, while you're still looking at the thing you photographed if it hasn't moved. So if you do get involved in iNaturalist and you have a smartphone, you probably will want to download that and install that uh, application because it is well, a real lifesaver. And with the quality of the cameras that are in smartphones these days, you can do some really exceptionally fine work with just your phone camera. I actually use a, 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 a mirrorless camera with a macro lens for most of my work. So I use this uh, the web platform much more often. But let's see how it works. Um, I'm going to go to the page where you add, just click that add observations buttons. And uh, ordinarily I, I, I downloaded these onto a computer because I don't have enough uh, uh, USB slots on my computer to do this everything all at once. But here's what I did. And let's, let's just take a look at what I photographed the other day. We got a flower, 
And I took a flower, a, picture, a photograph of some of the leaves of that flower too, because often uh, it is helpful to have both the leaves and the flowers to identify a plant. I took a picture of this wasp-like thingy, and then I took a couple more pictures of it because it was being cooperative and why not? I took a picture of a different wasp-like thingy. I took a picture of a cicada. That thing nearly hit me in the head. It was pretty spectacular. I surprised that it was perched low to the ground and then landed on a railing and I was able to get a picture of it. Uh, I took a picture of another flower. And again, I also took a picture of the leaves. And I took a picture of a lichen, which I hardly ever do, but you gotta live dangerously. You know, it's a, you gotta shake things up. Okay, so all you do to create an observation in iNaturalist is click and drag and drop these images right here, okay? So these are of the same plant, uh, just different views of the same plant. So I want to combine them into one observation. So I select all and I combine. We now have one observation and you can see it's one observation with two photographs in it. So we, we need to give it a name now. So I put the cursor here and it uh, goes to work and we get these wonderful suggestions and Clethra ulnifolia is exactly what it is. I happen to know that, uh, but if you didn't know it, uh, iNaturalist would have just told you what it was. Okay, then the other thing, uh, this has already uploaded the date and the time because that is imprinted on the image by my camera. If I had a different camera that had GPS capability, the location might have uploaded as well too. And if you use that iPhone app, smartphone app that I was telling you about, uh, you definitely should have your GPS turned on and, and enabled for your camera because it really saves a lot of time. But we need to do it manually because I have an old fashioned camera. So what you do is you click the location window and it gives you this and I'm at 18, sorry, 18 now in Vineyard Haven, Massachusetts. And you can zoom in on where we are. Uh, here is the Biodiversity Works office building. These roads aren't in the right place quite, so we're going to have to use the... Uh... So that clethora bush is right in front of our front door. It's right there. And that circle now indicates where the, uh, the observation is from, okay? So there will be a corresponding pin on the map of Martha's Vineyard when you go to the iNaturalist project. So you update the observation and that's all there is to it. We submit one observation and it, it takes a couple of seconds to upload and you're in business. You've added another observation to iNaturalist and the intertubes are slow tonight. Okay. Um, we have more material though, and I'm gonna show you how to do multiple observations. If they're from the same general area, you can save a lot of time by doing it that way. Let's do all of the uh, wasp number one photographs. Okay, and again, because this is all gonna be one observation, we combine it and we've got one observation with three photographs. We go back to our um, folder here. We drag wasp number two out. Uh, we drag that big wonking cicada out. We drag this plant. And again, we've got two photographs. And I'm, I'm, I, you can't see my keyboard. I guess I could, sh I, I, what I'm doing here is I'm clicking control and uh, that will highlight, it will select both of those um, images and then you can combine them. And then finally we have that lichen. So now we've got a bunch of images. They're all, they're all our records are all from the same general area. And we're gonna go through and we're gonna do the same thing that we did with that first one. And look, Monobia quadridens is, and you can take a look at that, a really good match for the wasp that we found here. So I'm going to go with that identification. 
This one's a little bit tricky because the photograph is a little overexposed and kind of blurry. The, the, the insect was bouncing around in the breeze a little bit, but let's see how well iNaturalist can do. Bingo, there's our guy. We'll try the, right now here, I'm not so sure of what I'm doing. Uh, I know this is the genus, I mean, it looks right, but we have a bunch of possibilities. We've got Lyricin and Canicularis. Um, it's a little bit hard to say from their pictures, which we've got. So I'm gonna play it safe here. I don't want to have um, wrong information in here if I can avoid it. I know this is the genus, but if I put in a species, I might not be right. So I'm gonna take the conservative approach and be safe and assume that probably someone is gonna come along or maybe it'll be me coming along with a little more work in getting this one to the species level. But I like to play by the rule in iNaturalist that you, you're better off being safe than sorry and better off identifying something to the genus level rather than to the species level if you're sure of the genus but not quite sure of the family. The point is to uh, make the data be good, not just to make the data be specific. So you want to do it as carefully as you can. Plant number two. Hmm. Take a look at spotted knapweed. Yeah, with these really fine, narrow leaves like we have, uh, I think that's what we've got. So, and this will be a little more challenging. I don't know anything about lichens. So, wow. That looks promising, doesn't it? We'll give that a shot. I mean, that's a, that was a very good visual match, it seemed to me. Okay, now we have, we still have to get the location into all of these um, observations. So what we can do instead of, uh, if they were all from exactly the same place, we could select all and just put in one location. But they're from around the property. And I like to be as specific as I can because, um, Sometimes it matters. Uh, Vicky, Helen, Cav, Bridget, Haven. Okay, so we're doing exactly what we did for that first observation. And this red circle, um, you can move it around, but you can't move the map around if your cursor is on the red circle. So usually what I do is just click to get the, um, all right. So that, uh, that first wasp was on the, uh, here we go, here's the beadworks office, that was on the clether bush right outside. So that's where that observation came from. All right, you click on the location here and you get a map that already shows the observation that you just put on it and you can scroll out or you can scroll in a little bit. I was up about here for that other observation loss. And for this guy, I mean, um, it was over on this side of the building. So we'll put that location there. This one was out behind the building, kind of on the parking lot. So we'll add that location. And this was on a pile of wood also out behind the building. Okay, so now we've got five observations with a photograph and with an identification and with a, a date and time and with a location. So they're all uh, uh, perfectly good observations. We're gonna upload them all. We'll wait for a few seconds for it to, uh, to go through. All right. Now, we can go back to these observations and take a look at them. Um, one thing that you can do is when there is an identification here, you can compare uh, 
Let's see if we have any from Massachusetts that are similar. Okay, so now we're sort of confirming the work that we did initially. And I, again, I still like that visual match. This seems like it's a, because there are a lot of records, it seems like it's a fairly common species, which uh, militates for it being what you found. And the shape and the, uh, the, the form of the, the, the lichen itself makes me think we're in pretty good shape with that identification. So I think we're, um, we're good to go on that one. All right, so what will eventually happen with these is sooner or later, somebody will come along, it will show up in their feed and they will say, um, okay, this is, uh, we can't identify this any further. So they'll, they'll agree with the um, identification that I put up and it'll just stay at the genus level. Or maybe they'll say, oh, well, this is Neotibison uh, canicularis. We can actually tell what the, what the species it is. And if that's the case, they would add an identification, which I could then agree with, or somebody else could agree with. And eventually we would get to the consensus of it being a research grade observation. Now, one thing I do wanna point out, go back to the dashboard for the time being, is um, photos are a really important part of the process, as you will have gathered. And it, it behooves us to think a little bit about the information that we're putting up in, uh, in, in terms of photographs into iNaturalist. Um, just arbitrarily picking one off of my dashboard here. <clears throat> this is kind of a difficult photograph to work with. It's not a very good image. You're not in close, but you can zoom in and you can see some characteristic features on it. There is this, uh, this stripe, which is how I knew what genus it belonged to. But the better the photograph is, the better the chances are that somebody is going to be able to identify it. And it's also really important that sometimes the first point of view that you get on uh, an insect is not gonna be very helpful. Um, let's just see if I can find an example from my own uh, observations here. Um, let's see. Well, let's go back to this uh, Lafria champlainii. Um, the first picture that I took is a pretty good picture. It shows uh, a lot about, you can see the really thick femora on the legs here and the, the fact that the thorax is all covered with yellow hair and the fact that the facial hair is yellow. These are all things that kind of matter with uh, robber fly identification. You wouldn't know that unless you studied robber flies for a while, but maybe eventually you will. But I took probably 20 photographs of this insect, and on a couple of them, the wings were spread, and that shows, you know, a lot of the insect that you can't see in that first picture because the wings are pretty much obscuring it. And I thought, well, Sometimes the pattern on the back, how much yellow, how many segments of the abdomen are black versus yellow can be uh, important information. And a lot of times with flies, the way that the veins of the wings are arranged can be important. So uh, I thought it was worth including this extra photograph. And it's helpful then to add a bunch of different points of view on something you may not, you may, as you learn more, you'll learn what angles are, are important for identifying particular kinds of things. But even if you don't know, if you've got four or five good photographs from different angles of something, um, upload them all because you don't know which one of those is going to be the important one for somebody who's trying to identify it. And by the same token, when you're taking photographs in, in the wild of something, don't just snap one picture of the first angle that you have. Now move around it, try to get close, try to get really good images, try to get a side view and a top view and a picture of the face and a picture of the legs and a picture of the wings, as many pictures as you can get. And then you can upload three or four or five of those uh, along with your observation. And that will really help uh, people who try to do identification work for you. Okay, so I've mentioned the, um, the role that other people play in performing, uh, in, in, in adding identifications, you can't really force that. Um, uh, people will be, but people will be searching. You know, you can't, uh, one thing you can do though is 
if you know somebody who might be able to help and you go to an observation, red stag beetle, that's a pretty good find for Martha's Vineyard. Um, you can tag somebody. I'll, I'll show you how you would tag myself. You use the ampersand and then their, uh, their, their username. So if you did that and click done, it would, it would uh, turn up in my feed because you, you've tagged me, just like when you tag somebody in a Facebook photograph. Uh, so that, that's one way that you can call somebody's attention to what's going on here. And I'm going to take a quick look at this, uh, this insect because it's a nice uh, find if it's what she says it is. And we can click compare. And you can see it's pretty much, the, the difference is the mandibles are much smaller, but that's because these are males and the males have really large mandibles, but uh, everything else looks good for that species. So I'm gonna go and agree. So I've added an identification to AB George, uh, what AB George had done, and eventually this will refresh itself and uh, there is a, we definitely have a stag beetle. I, we don't know quite what kind yet, but somebody will definitely be able to figure that out. I may even be able to at some point. Um, so uh, I'm gonna sign out of uh, iNaturalist. I'm going to stop sharing and uh, return to my uh, natural self here. And that's really all I've got for you tonight. Uh, I hope it was a useful introduction. I hope you will give it a try. Uh, there was a lot more in iNaturalist that we didn't cover tonight. As I said, I'm not a particularly proficient user. And there are a lot of utilities in there that I don't really know, have never tried, have never even discovered. Uh, but it is a great platform. It's really um, not intimidating. It has great support, it's really easy to use. And it will help you become a better naturalist and it will help you get more enjoyment out of the, the natural history studies that you do. So it's a, I really hi highly recommend it as something for, um, for all of you to try. Um, I guess that is the end. I will take one look. Uh, I was hoping that there, oh, there is a chat window. I don't think anything is in there. We did get a little message from somebody who had a, a, a wonderful moth turn up. Um, we will close that. But again, I thank you for your time. Um, I would also encourage you to um, keep me in mind. Uh, I, you have my email address because I emailed you, uh, or the Biodiversity Works email address anyway, because we emailed you with the uh, uh, information about this, this webinar. And I encourage you to use it. I, I, my, part of my job as the director of the Atlas of Life is to help and support and encourage people who want to improve as naturalists. And I really enjoy nothing better than coming in in the morning and finding a couple of emails in my inbox saying, hey, I photographed this butterfly the other day. I think it might be so-and-so, can you confirm that? Or, hey, I photographed this really cool wasp, any idea what it is? This is what I live for. This is something I really enjoy doing. So don't be bashful. Don't think that you're pestering me when you ask me natural history questions. And uh, don't hesitate to tag me, M Pelican, uh, if you upload things into iNaturalist. Um, if you do them from the vineyard, I'll be seeing them anyway because I check out the project on a, probably four or five times a day to see what's there. And I do what I can to help um, identify things. But that's it. I will let you go on about your evenings. We're done in less than an hour, which is good um, because my voice is giving out as it usually does at the end of these things. But again, thank you very, very much for participating and thank you for your interest in biodiversity works and in the Atlas of Life and for uh, your interest in the wildlife of Martha's Vineyard. We live in a wonderful place. We're very fortunate. We should all work together to learn about it and appreciate it and protect it. And with that, I will be signing off. Thank you very much.